I just received my Bowers & Wilkins 705 S2 speakers from Best Buy. I purchased these as open box units. Um, they didn't arrive in the original packaging. It almost sounds like the, the guys at Best Buy just threw both speakers in here and uh, taped it up and called it good because when I move this box around, there are a lot of pieces um, moving around inside here. It almost sounds like something's seriously broken. So let me just give it a quick shake for you. That way you guys can hear it on camera. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't sound good. So I'm going to go ahead and open them up now. Oh. Oh. Yikes. Well guys, these are the Bowers & Wilkins 705 Series 2's that I purchased from Best Buy. I bought these as open box units and the condition stated that they were in excellent condition. Right there you can see it on the slip, it says excellent, but they are far from that. Oof, these are bad. These are in bad, bad shape. Look at the cabinets, just got dings, got gouges in them, scratches all over the place and the gloss finish. I was hoping to use these in my gym. That's what I purchased them for, but these will definitely be going back. I don't know if that's showing up. Gouge. What's really wild is the tweeter housings. I mean, they're just completely loose and flopping around on top here. So the mounts definitely broke inside the cabinets for these. And obviously this grill, which was supposed to be here, completely fell off. Um, this is my first time buying open box speakers from Best Buy, so maybe you guys know more about it than I do, but I was under the assumption that when you buy open box items that are classified in excellent condition that you get the original box, paperwork, accessories, and grills. I didn't get any of that. Basically, they took these two speakers and just threw them in this box here, it's just a generic uh, UPS box, and I'm guessing these were at one time those air packs, you know, they're like, they puff up and they have air inside of them, or maybe they're just plastic bags, but either or, yeah, not smart to do that. That's why it's so important that when you ship speakers that are this delicate, that you use the original packaging. So I'm not going to be able to do a review on these speakers, but I think I'll still do a teardown on them because that'll give us an idea of how these things are constructed, even though the condition is in pretty poor shape. We can still get an idea of the cabinet construction, the TS parameters of the drivers. We'll look at the crossovers, see if there's any ferromagnetic parts in them. And uh, we'll just go down the line. So let's get started. Before I start the teardown of this speaker, let me tell you a little story. When I was going to college in the early 2000s, I know this is dating me a bit, I was very fortunate enough to have parents who paid for my four-year degree, but I had to pay for my room and board. In order to pay for this, I worked two jobs. At my first job, I sold jet skis, and at my second job, I sold Bowers & Wilkins speakers, and I sold a lot of them. In the early to mid-2000s, the 600 line and CDM line was very popular. During my time selling Bowers & Wilkins, I got to know the brand very well and thought their build quality was one of the best in the industry at the time. Now that the B&W Group has been bought and sold a few times, I'm curious to see if their products still represent the same quality that I'm used to seeing from them. And close are a few pictures of my dorm room from back in the day. I'm hoping these pictures will illustrate just how crazy I was about speakers, and that nothing has really changed. My first pair of Hi-Fi speakers were a set of Bowers & Wilkins 602 S3s, and then I moved into a pair of CDM1 NTs. And then my credit card company thought it was a wise idea to give a broke audiophile like myself a significant credit line increase. So I went out and bought Nautilus 803s. Yeah, that wasn't very smart on my part. But hey, I was young, dumb, and most of all, broke. Unfortunately, I couldn't afford to keep my beautiful Nautilus 803s for very long because of that killjoy thing called bills. But it sure was badass having them in my dorm room. Seriously, what did those crazy people over at Discover Card think was going to happen when they give a broke 20-something audiophile with a credit card that has a $10,000 credit limit? Thankfully, I'm much wiser financially than I was back then. So please don't do what I did and learn from my mistake. And now for the teardown. 
To remove the base driver, I first need to remove the beauty ring around the woofer. This beauty ring just snaps into place and can be removed with your fingers. Simply place your fingers under the lip of the beauty ring and pry up on it, and it should come loose. This beauty ring on the 705 S2 is made of plastic. Holy cow, maybe nothing has changed over at B&W. There are eight, yes, eight, four millimeter Allen screws that hold in a single six and a half inch driver. I can't think of another speaker off the top of my head that uses this many screws to fasten a six and a half inch driver to the front baffle. The speaker terminals that connect to the back of the driver are gold plated. B&W even went a step further and soldered the gold plated terminals to the wires instead of just crimping them on. This is the kind of quality I expect from speakers costing $3,000 plus dollars. Back when I was selling B&W speakers they were known for their yellow cones made from Kevlar. Now B&W is using a material made of continuum which is a woven material proprietary to Bowers & Wilkins. The exact composition of this material is something B&W is keeping a secret, but B&W claims this new material delivers a more open and neutral mid-range. It's a shame my speakers are too badly damaged to test this theory. If you own a pair of these speakers, please let us know how you like the sound of them by commenting down below. B&W is using a 6.5 inch driver in the 705 S2. This driver has a die cast aluminum basket which is much better at controlling resonances than a stamped steel basket. The motor structure on this driver uses several design techniques to keep the voice coil cool. It uses a vented pole piece as well as surrounding the voice coil with vents underneath the spider. This venting under the spider is especially useful in keeping that voice coil cool when you have the speakers cranked up. Now let's get this driver on my scale to see how much it weighs. Not bad, this driver weighs 3 pounds and 13.5 ounces. Next I measured the impedance of the mid-base driver and tweeter. The mid-base driver had an impedance of 3.9 ohms and the tweeter had an impedance of 2.9 ohms. Here are the TS parameters that I measured from the mid-base driver. Holy cow, this is the lowest inductance woofer I have measured yet. This driver has an inductance value of 0.06131 millihenries. If you don't know this already, then let me tell you that a speaker's sound quality is directly correlated to the inductance of its voice coil. Speakers with low inductance values will have better sound quality than speakers with high inductance value, because high inductance is a major source of harmonic distortion. For a 6.5 inch driver, this speaker should have some decent bass judging by the resonant frequency of 44.58 Hz. It will be interesting to see how low B&W tuned the port on the 705, which I'll test later. Unfortunately, I cannot disassemble the tweeter. B&W requires you to have special tools in order to service the tweeter, and these tools can only be purchased from Bowers & Wilkins. I really hate when manufacturers do this because then you're at the mercy of the dealer, which oftentimes isn't good. I really hope someone from B&W watches this video so when they design the next generation of speakers, they will allow us to repair them ourselves. After all, we paid good money for these types of speakers and we should be able to repair them. The 705 S2 uses a tube-loaded tweeter design which has been around since the Nautilus series from the late 90s. What is cool about this tweeter housing is that it's made from a solid block of aluminum. This thing is very well built and is super quiet. The tweeter dome in the 705 is made from carbon. This tweeter dome combines the use of aluminum with a thin layer of carbon over top of the dome to increase its stiffness. Bowers & Wilkins claims that by using carbon on the dome that it raises the dome's breakup frequency to 47,000 Hz. For comparison, the 800 series speakers which use a diamond dome tweeter have a breakup frequency of 70,000 Hz. A lot of these specs are specifically made just for the marketing department because humans cannot hear beyond 20,000 Hz anyways. 
The tweeter in the 705 is really good. Check out that low resonant frequency that I measured. This means the woofer can focus on things that it's good at, like bass and mid bass frequencies, instead of trying to extend itself into the upper ranges. The cabinet on the 705 is what I would expect from a set of bookshelf speakers costing $3,000 plus. The front baffle on the 705 is just under 1 inch in thickness and has a significant brace in the center of the cabinet which ties the sides, top, and bottom walls together to further reduce cabinet residences. B&W also did a nice job of damping the inside of the enclosure. Every cabinet wall except for the front baffle is lined with damping material. This is a very nicely constructed cabinet that is very solid to the feel. The crossover on the 705 is mounted on the back of the terminal cup. All you need is a Phillips head screwdriver to remove it. Oof, look at the size of that air core inductor. Look at that poly cap. Bowers and Wilkins didn't disappoint on the crossover components either. The 705 has some very nice components, including a Mundorf silver gold Evo cap on the tweeter circuit, and the woofer circuit contains a very nice air core inductor. B&W is utilizing a first order crossover design in the 705. The port on the 705 measures 5 inches in length and is flared on both ends to reduce chuffing noises. I then put the speaker on the bench to measure the port tuning of the enclosure, and it came in at 54 hertz, which isn't far off from the spec that B&W provided. Now it's time to test it for ferromagnetic parts. Nothing on the binding post. Nothing on the binding post plate. What about the screws that hold the binding posts in? Most companies put steel screws or nuts or fasteners on the binding posts. Oh, nice job, BMW. Nothing. All right, no ferromagnetic parts. And that's my look inside video on the Bowers and Wilkins 705 S2 speakers. In my opinion, it doesn't look like much has changed over at B&W from what I can tell. B&W is still building a quality cabinet with quality drivers and crossover components in their speakers. It's a shame my speakers arrived damaged because I was really looking forward to comparing them to the Focal Aria 906 that I also had in for review. If any of my viewers own a pair of these speakers, please let me know how they sound and if you are happy with them by leaving a comment down below. So long and happy listening.